the Red Sea, Rosie, yesterday. Shocking. British, yeah. British and American Navy vessels repelled what has been so far the most significant Houthi attack yet, comprised of 18 drones, three missiles. Following the flare-up, the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps warned action would be taken if the attacks don't stop, adding, watch this space. Well, let's speak to the former NATO commander, Chris Parry. Chris, a very good morning. For anyone who isn't familiar with what happened yesterday, can you explain the threat was identified and, and dealt with pretty swiftly? Well, uh, good morning. Yes, um, it was uh, US and uh, Royal Navy warships that um, uh, brought down 18 drones um, and two anti-ship missiles and an anti-ship ballistic missile, one that goes high in the sky and then falls at you very fast indeed. So um, this is a pretty good show by three American destroyers, uh, our own HMS Diamond and F-18 Super Hornets from uh, the US carrier Eisenhower, uh, and they got the lot. Chris, good morning. Welcome, as ever. Um, we'll talk about, you know, what these attacks mean for world trade. Let's talk about what it means for the status quo in the world. And I think it's really important to take stock for a minute. You know, Russia is still at war with Ukraine. What is happening in Gaza between Israel and Hamas, everybody knows, and all those problems that have ensued. Um, this is another angle. The these are dangerous times, my friend. Well, I think... Uh... Jeremy Rosie, we've spoken over several weeks now of the fact that the world is divided into two main blocks. You've got the totalitarian Eurasian autocrats of Russia, China, Iran and North Korea who are confronting the free world. And uh, most of that is happening in the gap between uh, the two blocks. Uh, as you say, we've seen Ukraine, uh, we've seen Afghanistan in the past. Uh, we're now seeing uh, Iran pushing on to the greater Middle East and Israel. Anticipate this year, <clears throat> you're going to see a lot of uh, Chinese pressure on the South and East China Sea, and I suspect that North Korea uh, will push on to South Korea as well. We're in an existential struggle now, even though we don't appear to be at war. We're seeing a lot of proxy wars going on, and these sorts of what I call encounter actions taking place in the space between the two blocks. And uh, as you can see, it's involving real uh, world missiles, real world uh, armaments and things like that. Right now, it's below the level of direct confrontation. Uh, but I must say, as a forecaster, if, uh, if Iran prevails against Israel, neutralizes Israel, you'll see it start to assert itself in the greater Middle East. If Russia uh, prevails in Ukraine, you'll see Russia pushing on to Sweden and Finland and perhaps the Baltic states as well. These totalitarian states are on the march and we're seeing a essentially a rerun of the late 1930s. We've got fascist and communist regimes asserting their military uh, and other power. Iran specifically, Grant Chaps yesterday, speaking of the Houthi rebels, said Iran with their eyes, their ears, has said if this continues, you will see stronger military action. Yep. Who are we doing that in partnership with and, and what kind of shape might that take, Chris? Well, Rosie, um, you know, we've been saying probably half a dozen times now we're going to take action. Um, I'm a great believer that if you threaten action, you should do it if people uh, don't behave. Um, so I think what's happening is obviously the Americans are in the lead here. They've got the technology, they've got the mass, they've got uh, three aircraft carriers in the area. And I think you'll find that the surveillance systems, the, the communication systems that are used by the Houthis with the Iranians, the command centers, if they have any, uh, and also their missile launchers and a few representative uh, units on the ground will be hit by uh, missiles and strike aircraft from the carriers. Chris, um, one of the things that, that people will often say when we cover stuff like this is, oh, come on, this is, you know, this is warmongering, this is, this is warning about things that, that can't and won't happen. I was quite taken yesterday, but I don't know which minister it was, but a minister in Sweden said, uh, you know, we're approaching uh, joining a, a new body, I think, NATO. We need to be ready for war. You touched upon it there. If Russia is successful in Ukraine, countries like Sweden could be next. And it is, it seems like a seminal moment. The Houthis backed by Iran, the problems with Hezbollah. And I don't think it's over an over-exaggeration to say these are quite torrid times. Uh, yes, they are. And I'm afraid for 70 years we haven't known this sort of atmosphere. Uh, but I have to say, both as a military practitioner and also uh, as a forecaster, we are literally back in the 1930s in the sort of threats that we are facing. And, and Trotsky, uh, Leon Trotsky, said something very important. He said, you might not be interested in war, but war is now interested in you. 
Uh, and we have to get to grips with the fact that there are countries out there that wish to do us harm. Mm -hmm. And if you add to that weaponized migration, which they're using, and also the threat from uh, Islamist uh, extremists, uh, we are going to have quite an interesting time over the next few years in coming to grips with this multiplicity of threats. I'd love to ask you, we've talked a little bit about some of the things that Grant Chap said yesterday. He's caused a little bit of uh, controversy over his comments when he was talking about um, the Royal Navy's first... Uh, the Royal Marines, sorry. Mm. He, Grant Chaps, has caused a bit of a row by asking the Royal Navy's first sea lord to, I'm quoting here, provide a plan for how the Royal Marines' excellent work is taken forward. Um, some interpreted that as saying Grant Chaps was sort of asking for justification um, for them sort of having a role at all. What did you make of it? Well, it's quite interesting because um, the future commando force was set up uh, nearly four years ago uh, to adapt to modern conditions. And that role was confirmed by the integrated review of 2019. So I'm surprised that we're reviewing it again. What's at the heart of this, Rosie, is they want to put into reserve two of the amphibious ships, Albion and Bulwark. Now, if you take those ships out of the front line, it's rather like saying to the parachute regiment, you're never going to parachute again. You're not going to. So in the case of the commandos, they're not going to be at sea and be able to use as a strike force from the sea. Um, now, I understand where Grant Shapps is coming from. He's saying that if you want to maintain your current force mass amid the sort of financial crises, tell me what you think your role is. My, my view is, um, my own view is, the Royal Marine Commando is probably the best infantry in the world. You touch them at your peril uh, because they are part of you know, what we're proud about in the United Kingdom. We should be proud. They are absolutely first-rate uh, fighting troops. Um, and, you know, they have 32 weeks training instead of the normal 12. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Marines say, you know, you don't choose us, we choose you. They're we've that actually, good. Chris, we've actually got Admiral Lord West uh, later on in the programme talking yeah. about the impact. I, I thought something else when I, when I heard that question, whatever uh, the strategy. We'll remember, of course, that Ben Wallace sort of resigned... I'm not saying in a fit of pique, but one got the distinct impression that he was resigning from the Cabinet about, you know, defence not being at the forefront of the Prime Minister's spending plans, whether it's cuts or, or, or changing the way things are done. One wonders whether Shaps is on manoeuvres, but I'm absolutely with you. The Marines are, 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 are what one of the things that this country is most proud of. Jeremy, the basic problem is that during my career, there was always this idea that there were no votes in defence. Yeah. I would say to our listeners and also to the British public, right now there have to be votes in defence because if we don't get our defence and security right against these massive threats from Russia, Iran and China, we won't get to choose about anything else, hospitals, schools, anything, um, just as the Ukrainians are finding now. Chris Parry, always a, a pleasure. Thank you so much indeed for joining us.